Hello, this is Dr. Wakefield. Um, we had a little audio issue with the recording earlier, so I'm going to go over Dr. Parker's slide here and then transition into uh, Dr. Parker talking about the rest of the lab. So uh, this is the Diaz auto reaction. This first line here is our main chemical reaction where we have 2,3-dimethyl uh, butadiene uh, and phenyl uh, malamid, uh, reacting it between 80 and 90 degrees to form this bicyclic product. Now the diene uh, is shown in the S trans conformation. Uh, Diaz alters can only happen if the diene is in the S uh, cis conformation. So this red arrow that is between the two double bonds is indicating that we're able to rotate around that single bond to get to the S cis conformation shown below. Um, at 80 or 90 degrees, the um, double bonds in the diene and the dienophile are able to interact and react, and the reaction occurs. So the electrons between carbon 1 and carbon 2 of the diene attack carbon 6. The electrons between carbon 6 and carbon 5 of the uh, diene can attack carbon 4, and the electrons between carbon 3 and carbon 4 push up uh, to make the double bond between carbon 2 and carbon 3, and then that leads to the product. Now, the diene and the dienophile are both symmetrical, which means uh, that when they react, you can only ever form one product because it doesn't matter how they are oriented uh, to each other. Now, the stereochemistry, we start with two A chiral molecules, and as a result, we're going to make an a chiral product. In this case we have stereocenters but um, this molecule has a plane of symmetry it's meso so it's not technically chiral so these two molecules are uh, the same so it doesn't matter if you draw um, the hydrogen up and the carbon on a dash or the carbon on a wedge and the hydrogen on uh, a dash because you can just flip that over and they're the same thing. So we start out with two a chiral molecules uh, that are symmetrical and we spit out a meso product. So we're not going to make uh, anything that is chiral. Um, so the she notes here that the geometry of the double bonds is in the diene is transferred, sorry, in the dienophile is transferred to the product, right? So you have the two uh, carbonyls are both on the same side of the double bond, so in the product they both have to be on the same side of the molecule, either both down or both up. So this kind of ends where we need to get caught up with what Dr. Parker had, and from here uh, she's going to talk about the reaction some more, a little more detail, and then the second half of the video is going to be me actually in the lab doing the reaction and kind of giving you the values that you need to use to uh, do your calculations to complete the, uh, the project. Just a few, like, so I'm going to also not only detail the theory, but also go through like the procedure as if I were going to discuss like how you would set this up in lab, because that's also important. And we're going to do the best we can. You know, we're not going to actually do the setup, of course, but, um, I want you to start getting familiar with like the setups if you're just to like read it from a procedure. So um, the first thing to know about these products is I'll also describe some of the starting materials. So this 2,3-dimethyl butadiene, right, and here I've drawn it in the S-trans conformation, right, this 2,3-dimethyl butadiene is a very low boiling liquid. So it's got a low boiling point, okay? So in this reaction, we actually use excess to ensure um, that all of the dienophile gets reacted. And the reason is because we're um, heating the reaction gets heated 
for approximately 45 minutes. So just in case the volatile, oops, two, three dimethyl, just in case that um, evaporates, maybe some escapes through our system, right? Enough will still be present. To consume the other starting material or react. And remember the other starting material is our dienoflavin. Okay. So this guy you can look them up is a clear liquid and we use a very small volume of, of it. So we usually when I tell people to go get that, you, you use a syringe, use a one milliliter syringe. It's got markings on it and you add it straight to your round bottom flask. And I would say, why would we do that versus like, um, as it says we need, let's see, 520 milligrams. But if it's a liquid, right, we need to convert that to milliliters. Um, so make sure and do this in your notebook. Show the conversion in your notebook. Okay. <clears throat> How would we convert um, milligrams to milliliters? Would you How do we convert mass to volume? Well, wouldn't you convert into the basic unit, so milligrams to grams, so then you can use the relationship between how much a liquid uh, mass is to its volume? Yes. And so we'd have to do like grams times some amount of grams in one milliliter. Mm -hmm. What do we call this guy? Grams per milliliter. The density? Density, right? And so what I've just shown here is dimensional analysis, right? using our units to guide us through to get our desired unit, right? So <clears throat> what we end up with, and I won't tell you what you get because you're going to tell me that in your notebook, um, but what, um, why would we use our one milliliter syringe to get out of, to get out our two, three dimethyl butadiene? Why wouldn't we put it in like a beaker or an Erlenmeyer flask, not an Erlenmeyer flask, maybe a graduated cylinder, and then transfer that to our round bottom. What happens if we're just transferring small amounts of things from one vessel to another? Do you think everything would make it in from the syringe to our round bottom? No, ma'am. No, right? We have to then worry about transfer loss, right? So that's why we add or would add a very small amount straight from our one mil syringe to the round bottom flask. We do this to minimize our transfer loss, right? Now, if you're transferring like, let's say 500 grams and you lose a gram or lose a, let's say, lose a milligram, it's not that big of a deal, right? There's a large difference in between how much you're actually using and how much that was lost. But let's say you're only transferring five milligrams and you lose a milligram. Well, then you've lost 20 of your, 20% 20 of your material, right? So it, it all is just relative to how much you're using. So especially with small amounts, you wanna do your best to not transfer 
um, to a bunch of different vessels, right? Transfer it right to your flask. All right, so that's that. It's a clear liquid. Our dienophile Our N phenyl malamid is a yellow, and I should like do this for like to get it into our head, is a yellow solid. Okay. Yellow solid. Easy to work with. Just weigh them out on the balance. Okay. Um, and let's say, um, you see it says we need 250 milligrams of this material. I want you guys to pretend that you weighed out 255 milligrams, okay? So this is our actual weight. And yes, I'm just making this up off the top of my head, but you will use this for your numbers when you do your theoretical yield. Okay, so you've actually weighed out 255 milligrams, or this would be how many grams, right? This would be 0.255 grams. So this is what you would see on a balance, okay? All right, so let's pretend we use that amount. It's a yellow solid. Um, let's take a look at our setup. So let me... First, let me actually save those photos real quick so I don't lose them. So um, instead of capping, put a cap right here, we can keep the system open so we don't um, super pressurize your round bottom flask. And instead, we can just condense the vapors by putting a condenser on here. So this whole thing is your condenser. Okay, and it's got this water jacket around it, okay? So what you would do is you'd take a line from your hood and you'd hook up a hose to this bottom little nozzle, okay? And the water flows in, okay, and fills up and up and up until it reaches this top, okay? So it says water outlet out, so you'll have a rubber hose that connects and goes down into a sink and just empties, okay? So what you're doing is you're slowly replacing the water in this condenser and it's keeping it cold in there so it condenses any vapors that may boil up into the condenser, okay? So you see there's like vapors up here and this can either be solvent or any volatile reagents. And that's helpful, right? Because we know that we've got one reagent in particular that's volatile. That's our 2,3-dimethyl-butadiene, right? Our solid is not gonna be volatile at all, okay? So we don't have to worry about our N-phenyl N-phenyl um, malamid, okay? Just our 2,3-dimethyl-butadiene is volatile. And that's important because if it all boiled off, then we don't have anything to react with our dienophile. Okay? Remember, that guy looks like this. Okay? All right, so we've got our heat source here. And in this case for us, we said we're using that water bath to keep it consistently between like 80 and 90 degrees. We know it's definitely not gonna go past 100. But we need that heat to convert between the S trans to the S cis for our dying, right? All right. So back to this, once all these vapors come up here, if we have volatile vapors of our reagents or our solvent, and in this case, I think we're using 
ethyl acetate. So that's just the solvent. We usually write it as ETOAC for short, ethyl acetate. And it looks like this. So this is the acetate portion and we've got a two carbon sequence off the oxygen. So it's an ester, right? Um, so we call this ethyl acetate. It's just a solvent. It's non-reactive. It's just used as a medium for our reagents to react. Okay. So here we've got our ethyl acetate. And I'll just for short, because you guys know what these are now, but I'll, we'll put our diene and our dienophile, right? In there. And we simply just heat it for 45 minutes, okay? Nothing crazy. That's why I didn't go in and do this lab, actually. Um, so we heat it for 45 minutes. Now, when you originally put the two reagents together, okay, if I just tell you that ethyl acetate itself is, oops, that doesn't look good, is a clear liquid. The butadiene, if you remember, I told you was a clear liquid as well. And what did the N-phenyl malleate look like? Yellow solid. It's a yellow solid, right? So what do you think my reaction mixture is going to look like at the beginning? Yellow. It's going to look yellow, right? So it's going to be a yellow liquid at the beginning. So I'll just say initial, okay? I will tell you after 45 minutes, that looks like a juicy tomato versus a round bottom, but you know. After 45 minutes, it goes to clear. <clears throat> what do you think that indicates about the reaction? And usually a physical, a physical um, change indicates that there's a chemical change going on. So, what originally gave the reaction its yellow color? And you can just say the diene or the dienophile. Dienophile? The dienophile, right? Remember our N-phenylmalamide is the one that was yellow. So he was yellow. So after 45 minutes, what can you say about what's in that reaction flask? Is the yellow there anymore? No. No, he's clear, right? So therefore, what can you say about the presence of N-phenylmalamid in the reaction after 45 minutes? Is he there or not there? Not there. Not there, right? You could easily see if he's there because you would be able to see some kind of yellow tinge, right? But after, and usually this reaction happens after about 30 minutes, but we go 45 minutes just in case. So it starts initially as yellow, and we can actually tell the reaction progress whenever you start to see that yellow fade away, okay? And that means that he's not present. So what's happening to the N-phenylmalamid? he's reacting with the diene, right? <clears throat> so we've had even cases where like, maybe someone didn't put on their condenser, or turn on the condenser before um, they started heating and maybe they lost some of this diene, right? It evaporated before it could get condensed. So what would we do? We would just simply add more of the diene until 
the yellow all disappeared, right? It, it'd be an easy fix, which is pretty cool. All right, any questions about that? Another thing about this condenser, and I kind of alluded to it just now, but it's important to turn on your condenser or the water tap, right? Or the water flow. prior to heating. We don't want to lose any of our solvent or precious reagents, right? Because otherwise they'd evaporate out. When the vapors come up, right, they're going to hit the cold water flask or the water jacket. And they'll condense back down as a liquid, OK? So that's why you don't see the little vapors climbing higher than they are, right? As soon as they see that cold water and feel that cold water, they'll turn from gas back down into liquid again and fall back down into the flask, okay? And that's how you can tell you are getting a good reflux. You should see vapors coming up and then dropping back down the flask. So you might see like, little droplets, little legs on the side of the flask indicating that, okay? Questions on that? All right, so the process itself is, this setup is very easy, right? We just have a round bottom, we've got it in a water bath. Um, we make sure the water bath covers the line of the, um, solvent line in your flask so that we get good heat transfer. We've got a clamp here. We usually attach it to like a ring stand, something like that, um, to keep this whole system secure. We've got rubber hosing that go into the first nozzle or the bottom nozzle that transfers water into the water jacket of the condenser and it flows up and then you have another hose that comes out, so water outlets out, and that goes down into the sink. You leave it to reflux or boil, right, for 30 to 45 minutes and wait for that yellow color to disappear, indicating that n phenylmalamid has been consumed by the dyeing. Okay, so it's all reacted. And then you're good to work it up, okay? So I'm gonna let you guys read through the workup um, we then do a recrystallization and I'll just send out a little video out after this for you guys to look at that process. But recrystallization is a term we use to purify a solid, okay, or to crystallize a solid, which in turn does purify it and make it, um, you know, get those impurities out. Um, and then what you're supposed to do is get the um, weight of the final solid and determine the percent yield, okay? So I will give you, um, I will send out a weight um, that will pretend that you've isolated, right? Um, you will answer the pre-lab questions and the post-lab questions and determine the theoretical and percent yield, okay? The theoretical and percent yield, I also have a handout on Moodle, so you guys can look at that to, um, to determine that. This is like a Chem 111 concept, determining theoretical and percent yield, um, but I realize like it seems a little different in organic. It's really not. In fact, it's easier in organic to do this. So we don't deal with chemical formulas. We deal with, um, we deal with structures, so I feel like that makes it a bit easier. Hi, welcome to the Diaz Alder Lab. Um, we're gonna go through and do the basic setup for the lab following along in the uh, procedure that you were able to get from Moodle. And uh, I'm just gonna go through and do uh, each part, and I'm probably gonna cut it up so that it's easy to follow along. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at doing the setup and getting the water bath warm. So we're going to cut to that now. All 
All right, so this is kind of your basic setup for a reflux. So I've got a jack stand here at the bottom. Hopefully this isn't too shaky, sorry. Uh, and then I have above that a stir plate um, that I already have on to warm up the water bath to between 80 and 90 degrees. Uh, on top of that, I have the water bath, which is in a metal container so that it's not going to melt or anything. Uh, and then I have the setup for the glassware for the distillation above that. I'm going to zoom in here. By zoom in, I'm going to walk closer. Um, there you go. So I've got the 25 mil round bottom flask. I have a stir bar in there that you can see. I'm going to make it move. Right, so I've got a stir bar in there. Right, I have that at the flask clamped to the monkey bars in the back. And then above that, I have the distillation condenser, which is the bigger of the two condensers that you have in your kit. And that, again, is clamped to the monkey bars. A good rule of thumb is whenever you have a ground glass joint, you want to have a clamp on either side of that ground glass joint. So this isn't holding all of the weight itself, right? So I have it clamped above and below the ground glass joint so that I don't have a lot of weight on that. I have a thermometer um, clamp here. Then I'm gonna put a thermometer in here in a sec so I can make, uh, watch the temperature of the water. And I have one of my two uh, water lines attached. So I want to show you how to attach your water and how those are supposed to be uh, done here in the next part. So here you can see that I have the, the one line already hooked up. I want to show you how to hook up the other one. You're just going to take your piece of tubing, right? And you're just going to work it over, oops, work it over that ground, that, uh, uh, nipple, I guess for lack of a better word, and that's going to give you a good seal. You'll make sure that you push your tubing really far back onto the uh, the, the, uh, the holder so that it doesn't want to pop off. If you were going to do a reflex overnight or if you're going to like walk away for hours, you would usually want to attach your uh, tubing with uh, a wire or some other way to attach it to the glassware so if you get any kind of pressure going up it doesn't pop off. The other thing we're going to do that we can see from this angle, move this out of the way, is going to put on the thermometer. You want to make sure that you get a high temperature thermometer. There are two types of thermometers in the lab. There are thermometers that are uh, that only go up to like 70 degrees and then like this one, if we can get it to show, this one goes up to 260 degrees. Right, so we're only heating to 80 or 90, so we don't have to worry about blowing up our thermometer by heating it too hot. If we got one of the low temperature ones to stop to 60 degrees, that would be dangerous when we would actually measure the temperature we wanted. So here, all you have to do is on these thermometer, uh, um, uh, clamps, I got good words, right? is you just slide it, you push in to, to spread the clamp, you see fat arms in the way. You push here to spread open the clamp. You slide your thermometer in, you get it into your liquid, and there's a small screw on the side. You screw that screw in and it will tighten up and it will hold the thermometer. And so now all that's left is to put, uh, to run water through the condenser setup. So we have the tubing on the bottom and the tubing on the top. So the bottom always goes to the water source. So in the lab, the um, the faucets are going to be are going to be these nozzles that are a rib that you can attach to. So you're going to slide your bottom hose into that onto that uh, ridged uh, nozzle. And then your top hose goes into the sink. Ideally, you have a reasonable amount of like slack in your um, hose. So here you're gonna have it attached to your faucet. And then you wanna have some excess hose for the one going to the sink. 
So you kind of push it down into the drain so you're less likely to have it come out. The reason that you want to have the water in the bottom is when you start the water, right, once I get it going here, you'll see it fill in. We haven't turned the water on since like the spring. There we go. And you see how it fills and it fills the entire uh, length of the tube of the uh, condenser up and there's no gaps. That's because it's filling in from the bottom. If the water came in the top, it would just kind of fall down and come out and you wouldn't get this column of water all the way up the length of the condenser. And that's important because the whole point of the condenser is, is when uh, gases evaporate, you are going, they're going to hit that cold glass on the inside that's being cooled by that water, condense, and then fall back down into your flask. So it's a way to heat something at its boiling point without actually losing that compound or that solvent. All right, so now I'm going to weigh out the N-phenyl uh, melanin. Uh, just so you remember, right, you want to make sure you don't have the mass of your weighing container. So we're going to tear that. So we're going to zero that out. And we're going to weigh 250 milligrams of the phenyl melanin. Uh, let's see if I can get a good shot of this. This is what it looks like. It's a... And get it to get it to focus. Come on now. There we go. Got a yellow crystalline solid. So we're gonna add that. And so we need 0 0.25. We got a little too cautious there. Oh, that's why I make the big bucks. All right, so we're gonna go add that to a reaction now. So I'm definitely trying to give you a cook and show vibe here. So here are our ingredients from Ice Reagents. Not the whole way cooking show. I've watched a lot of British Bake Off recently. Um, so I have the fennel, and fennel uh, malinid. I have the ethyl acetate, and then I have over here in the syringe the two three dimethyl one three butadiene. Uh, you may be uh, going, wait a minute, they just gave us a mass in the lab, why is it a liquid we didn't get a volume? Well, I had to calculate what the volume was in that syringe, and so do you. So make sure you calculate that in your lab book. So now I'm going to show you how to put all that stuff into the reaction. Alright, so to add stuff, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to break the connection between the distillation head sorry, the distillation column and the flask. So you're gonna to wanna to loosen the clamp here, hold, pull this apart, right? Now you can put in your, uh, your solid. I'm gonna have to move this over a little bit to get more space to pour. Put in your solid. You can add your ethyl acetate as your solvent. Now what we're going to do is we're going to slide this to back over, right, and that's going to go together, right, and now we're going to raise up our water, get that thing warming. Our water bath is somewhere around like 50 right now, so we're almost where we want to be. And then what I'm going to do is to make sure that I don't lose any of the uh, dyeing, the beauty dyeing. I'm going to add it through the reflux condenser, right? So I'm just going to take this, put it in the top, and then add it into the reaction, and it's going to fall down into the reaction. This way, I have the condenser already going, so uh, when the uh, butadiene hits the warmer solvent, if it wants to evaporate, because it has a low boiling point, if it evaporates, it's going to hit that cold, glass of the condenser and then fall back down to the reaction so I don't lose any. So now at this point, this needs to stir for about 45 minutes. See if I can get a good look at what the solution looks like right now. Right, so you can kind of see it's, a, uh, it's right there. And I'm going to give you some almost like time-lapse footage of this as the reaction goes so you can see if there's any change to the reaction mixture.
look at this, you should be able to see that there is a slightly different color of this reaction than what it had been before. So we're gonna work this up now because the reaction is a different color. Okay, so we want this cool. So we want to turn off the water to the condenser. Uh, you're not going to see any change, right? Because the water is going up. So we need to pull it off of the the uh, faucet. And then the trick is, if you pick up the other end, the end going into the drain, you pick it up. It's going to let you drain the water out of the condenser. All right. So there's that. Now I've got to get the condenser off the flask. All I have to do is loosen this up, pull that up. Now the next step here is I need to pour the contents of my uh, round bottom flask into a beaker so I can evaporate off the liquid. So I'm just gonna take this off, just pour it in here as such. Right, you're gonna to try to keep the stir bar in the uh, round bottom. Right now, I need to rinse this with ethyl acetate. So we're gonna pour some ethyl acetate in. Right, give that a swirl. We're just trying to get any excess compound. Right, I'll we'll pour that into this beaker. So we should be good now. Now what we have to do is we have to put this beaker uh, back on the water bath. So we're gonna take off our condenser. We're going to move down a bigger clamp. We don't need our thermometer uh, adapter anymore because we just need this warm enough to evaporate up acetate. There we go. We're gonna slide this down. So now we can actually safely clamp our beaker. Okay. So now we can run this up and hopefully we have enough water to get to the level of our beaker. And if you look, we're a little short. So we're gonna add some more water and then heat this up until the solvent evaporates and we're left with like a, a thin, clear oil. We'll uh, maybe do a little time lapse of that for you, but let me get some water in here and get this heated up. All right, see you in a few. All right, so as you can see here, we put it in with a bunch of liquid. I'll turn it on its side here, get a frame. See, there's just an oil in here now. This oil should solidify if we make it cold enough. So I've already let it cool a little bit to room temperature. So I'm going to put it in the ice bath. Well, you saw it as a liquid there a second ago, and I put it in the ice bath, and it almost instantaneously solidified. I was hoping for a, a speed action shot, but didn't quite get there. So we're gonna give this a few more minutes to make sure it's fully solidified. Then we're going to warm it to room temperature and do the recrystallization. While we're waiting on that, we're gonna heat up some hexanes so that we can add hot hexanes to this um, uh, solid for the recrystallization. All right, so I know these shots aren't always the best. You know, I tried to get Steven Spielberg to help me out, but he was a little busy. So here's my warm hexanes, and then here's my solid. And so I'm gonna be adding hot hexanes. It's right around its boiling point, which is ideal for a recrystallization. So I've got my hexanes in here. I wanna keep it in the warm bath to keep the hexanes I'm, uh, that I've added to my solid warm. Now I'm gonna keep adding hexane, little by little, swirling, until my solid hopefully dissolves. You want to add as little hexane as possible so that you can keep a high concentration of your dissolved solid so that once you cool it, it will come out of solution. So more swirling. You can see that some of it has dissolved, but not, but clearly not all of it. Right, so let's add more part of what you're fighting right is since the hexane's at its boiling point you are um, 
you're losing hexanes as you're waiting, but you add some and some evaporates off. So a lot of times students will be like, well, I added 20 mLs, but there's nothing in the beaker because it has evaporated off as they've waited. Well, that was slubby. So you're gonna keep adding until you end up with, with your solid dissolved. So we might do a jump cut here to dissolve solid or close to it. It's still a little bit left, so we'll give it a little bit longer. All right, that's most of it. There's a little bit left, but I think we're going to call it good just for everyone's sanity. So that's most of it. Right, so now we're gonna let it cool, and as it cools, it's going to recrystallize. So as this cools, hopefully you'll be able to see crystals form. Um, I think we're gonna switch to time lapse, maybe, so that you can see it happen a little bit faster. So hopefully you can see here, when we get on the side maybe, we have a decent amount of crystals, right? We had a pretty much clear solution before, and now we have some crystals that have formed. So you try to make sure that we get the maximum amount of crystals out of this that we can. We're gonna throw it in the ice bath and let it sit for a few minutes uh, so that the rest of the, the solid comes out of solution, and then we're gonna vacuum filter it. So I'm gonna throw it in the ice bath, wait a few minutes, and then we'll set up the filtration. Okay, so we have a good, a, bit of, a good bit of solid here, so we can see in there after the uh, ice bath. So now we have to get our solid away from our liquid, and to do that we need a vacuum filtration. So we need a sidearm flask, right, and this thing called a Thomas adapter, right, we're going to put that on there. We need a Buchner funnel, right, it has big holes in it, so to actually be able to filter something off, you have to use a piece of filter paper, and then we need to have tubing to attach the sidearm flask to vacuum. So that's this tubing here. Notice it's thicker than the tubing we used for the uh, water for the uh, reflux because this has to withstand vacuum. So you don't want it to use you don't want to use thin wall tubing because it'll crush. So you're going to put that on the sidearm flask. And then we're gonna kind of tilt this up here. And then vacuum is the yellow. You're gonna put that on there. So now you're set up to do your um, filtration. There we go. 
Okay, so all you have to do is turn on the vacuum, right? And then just take your stuff. I like to get a little bit of liquid, just liquid if I can, to help stick down the filter paper. And you're just gonna pour what you can out. And then you're going to have thought ahead. It had a spatula. And you're gonna take a spatula or a glass rod and you're gonna pull that solid out of the flask or out of the beaker, I'm sorry. Right, and make sure that that is all, get as much as you can out. All right, so now all we have to do is weigh our solid. So there's what our solid looks like now. If you remember before we were crystallized, it was kind of like clumpy. Now it's this really thin flowing uh, needles. So I want to weigh this out real quick. Again, the same thing we did before. Throw your weigh boat in there. Make sure you tear so that it's zero. And we're going to just kind of carefully get both hands in here. Weigh out our solid. So our mass here is, wait for it, uh, 0.272 grams. So that's what we're gonna use for our yield calculations. Uh, we're gonna say point. 272, we might change something. Um, and then we're going to, also I will provide a melting point for this solid, and that should be everything you need to do your conclusion.